wa ta'ala wa la udwana ila ala dhalimeen and there is no udwan no enmity except against the people who are dhalimeen those who violate the right of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to be worshiped alone and oppress the creation ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la i testify that la ilaha illa Allah and nothing is deserving of worship as a deity other than Allah wahdahu la sharika la he is alone in that right without any partner wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu and i testify that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise his mention amongst the heavenly host and grant him the salam and grant him peace and freedom from all harm for eternity i testify that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a servant and the messenger of allah amma ba'du then to proceed then we have arrived tonight on the 11th page of our workbook here from the tremendous risala of the great scholar the allama of qasim and he the teacher of the teachers of the modern day outer scholars one of the great scholars who died in the late 1950s in the year 1376 after the hijra of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam shaykh abdur rahman ibn nasr al-sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala tonight being the 30th night of jumad al-awwal in the year 1440 after the hijra of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so we continue with a very important one of the most pivotal issues of aqida that is that has a mountain of evidence for it in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in the consensus of the sahaba and the statements of the earliest scholars to the point that it is from the clearest of things in Islam the issue of the highness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above his creation the issue of the highness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above his creation and perhaps we mentioned before that a number of scholars wrote entire books about this issue alone because of the wealth of evidence that is found in the authentic sources in the Quran and in the Sunna and Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he mentions any that there are i believe he mentions around 30 types of evidences 30 types of evidences and the categories of evidences on this issue and in, for each of those categories there are many proofs and many different things that branch off from it to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above and beyond his creation a separate from his creation it's a very very important matter of belief as we'll come to see exactly what this means inshallah ta'ala and the things that are connected to it pertaining Allah's names and his attributes and the types of ulu for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the types of highness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so here on the 11th page Sheikh Saadi rahimahullah ta'ala he says wa dakhala fi dhanika ithbatu uluwihi ala khalqihi wa istiwaihi ala arshihi that included in that meaning included in the tawhid of al asma'i wa sifat and singling out Allah with his right to be recognized for his most beautiful names and lofty attributes is the belief in the ulu of Allah in the highness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above his creation wa istiwaihi ala arshihi and the istiwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ascending of Allah the rising of Allah above the creation these are two different things that are similar but not synonymous they are similar but they are not exactly the same thing the scholars they say al ulu sifatun dhatiya the al ulu at the highness of allah tabarak wa ta'ala is from his eternal attributes meaning that allah has always and will always be described with ulu with highness above his creation as opposed to al istiwa al istiwa allah's rising above his creation like his rising and ascending above his creation after creating the universe his ascending over his throne tabarak wa ta'ala 
is sifatun fi'liyya. It is from the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, therefore it is connected to His will. He does it as He wills, when He wills, tabarak wa ta'ala. He does it as He wills and when He wills, tabarak wa ta'ala. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala is a nice side benefit. He says, he explains in a number of different places, such as in Madarij al-Salikin, in the beginning of the book where he explains the Fatiha in great detail, he says, pay attention to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described himself rising above his throne. We know that the throne of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, as comes in the hadith of Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Abil Mundir, radiyallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu wasallam, he said, what is a samawatu sab'u wal ardun? What is the entire universe? Fil kursi, in comparison to the kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Ibn Abbas, he said, al kursi mawdi'u al qadamain. The kursi is the place of Allah's two feet. In a matter befitting Allah's majesty, not resembling his creation, but exactly as Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has described himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and as the earliest Muslims understood about Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala. He says, what is that? إِلَّا كَحَلْقَةٍ مُلْقَى بِأَرْضِ فَلَا What is the entire universe compared to the kursi of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, which is a created thing, except like a halqa, like a ring that is thrown into a field except like a ring that is thrown into a field. This creation, the universe, compared to the kursi of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, which is a creation of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a ring thrown into a field. Right? He said, and what is the arsh compared to the kursi? Or what is the kursi compared to the arsh, except like that ring thrown into that field? And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, as we know, is above His creation in a manner befitting His majesty. And the kursi of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The kursi of Allah encompasses the heavens and the earth and Allah is above that and above everything and beyond everything in a manner befitting His Majesty. Tabarak wa ta'ala The greatness of Allah is something that is unfathomable. Tabarak wa ta'ala And so Ibn Qayyim he says think about how Allah describes Himself when He, sa- when he mentions in a number of places in the Qur'an And there are specifically seven different instances, almost in every instance probably except for one, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala uses a a specific name in mentioning His rising above His throne, which is what? Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. Ar-Rahman ascended above His throne. What is the sifa of Allah that is found in the name of Allah? Ar-Rahman. The attribute of Allah found in Allah's name, Ar-Rahman. If you know. Rahma. Was that your answer? Go ahead. I was going to say that that's the most he had experience with all of his creation. Mm, that's the answer I wanted. Right? The Rahma of Allah, because then my question would have been what is the difference between Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim then, right? And so the Rahma of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, Ar Rahmatul Wasi'a. Ar Rahmatul Wasi'a, the vast mercy of Allah. Right? As the Malaika, the Hamalatul Arsh, the carriers of the throne of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, they say, as Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala mentions in Surah Ghafir, that they say, Rabbana wa si'ta kulla shay'in rahmatan wa ilma. O oh Allah, you have encompassed all things, surrounded all things in mercy and in knowledge. The mercy of Allah reaches everything that His knowledge reaches. Tabarak wa Ta'ala. There is nothing that came into existence except by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether they die upon belief or disbelief, they're being brought into existence was a tremendous rahmah from Allah. They had the opportunity, whether they seize the opportunity or not is something else. But the knowledge of Allah and the mercy of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala surround all things. And so ar-Rahman is the one whose mercy reaches all things. The one who possesses vast Boundless mercy. And so when Allah tabarak wa ta'ala described himself rising above his throne, he used the name of he used his name Ar-Rahman, the one who has vast mercy. 
that reaches every part of the universe, every part of the creation. While he's mentioning that he rose above the universe, he mentions that, and he, he is Ar-Rahman, Tabarak wa Ta'ala. So this is something that is tremendous. A person, when they understand exactly what is meant by the ulu of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, and what we are going to mention, inshaAllah Ta'ala, that is found in the understanding of what is in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the three types of ulu, the three types of highness is something that is going to give us a further insight about the greatness of this attribute for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before that, the shaykh he says, وَنُزُولِهِ كُلَّ لَيْلَةٍ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا عَلَى الْوَجْهِ اللَّائِقِ بِجَلَانِهِ وَعَظَمَتِهِ That we believe that included in the belief in al-asma'i wa sifat and Allah being singled out with His names and His attributes, he says, is Allah's being above His creation, His ulu above His creation, and His ascending over His throne. وَنُزُولِهِ كُلَّ لَيْلَ Along with believing that Allah descends every night إِلَى السَّمَاءِ dunya to the lower heaven, to the lower heaven. عَلَى الْوَجْهِ اللَّائِقِ بِجَلَالِهِ وَعَظَمَتِهِ In a manner befitting His Jalala and his Adama, his majesty and his magnificence, Tabarak wa Ta'ala. Tayyib. So you have two things, the highness of Allah and his ascending, and Allah's descending, drawing near to the creation. Allah's descending to the lowest heaven in the last third of every night. As the Prophet ﷺ informed us and many a hadith about Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and he, or rather a hadith that has many turuq has many chains of narration and he that informs us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yanzilu that he descends fi akhiri thuluth al-layl or fi thuluth al-layl al-akhir in the last third of every night and he says hal min sa'ilin is there anyone asking me fa astajib lahu so that I can respond to his summoning of me. هَلْ مِنْ مُسْتَغْفِرٍ فَأَغْفِرَ لَهُ Is there anyone seeking my forgiveness so that I can grant him my forgiveness? May Allah give us tawfiq to take advantage of even a small portion of that. Just to even crack an eyelid if that's all that we could do. And say, Oh Allah, I ask you for afu and afia fi dunya wa akhirah, Allahumma ighfir li wa tuba alayya, and go back to sleep. If that's the least that you could do, at least you did something on the last third of the night, right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he informed about the husband and wife who wake themselves up in the last third of the night, and they pray two rak'atayn, yani two rak'a, right? They pray rak'atayn, two rak'a, yani even if it is something that is short, then they will be written amongst al-dhaqirin, Allah kathiran wa dhaqirat, those that Allah a'adda lahum maghfiratan wa ajran azimah. Those men and women that mention Allah frequently and much and often that Allah has prepared a great reward and forgiveness for. And so, this is something that is not contradictory in nature. The best answer that can be given for the people of shubuhat, for the people of doubts, who ask throughout the ages, throughout Muslim history, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend? What is the best answer? It's the same answer that we give for what? Kayfa stawa. How does Allah ascend? How did Allah ascend? We say, Al istiwa'u ma'loom, wal kayfu majhul, wal imanu bihi wajib, wa su'alu anhu bid'ah. That istiwa is something that is known. How, the modality of that, how Allah did, does that. How Allah does that is something that we don't know, right? Believing in it is mandatory, and asking about the how of it is an innovation, right? Asking beyond what is apparent is an innovation. That is something, and ilayhi sawarahu amal. There's no action connected to that, right? And the Islam, and he is not a religion that encourages aghru uh, thoughts. Yani suab al masail. Yani a person getting all extra deep into theoretics and so on and so forth, asking questions that are not directly connected to bringing him closer to Allah, making him a better servant and worshiper of Allah,
making him love Allah more, fear Allah more, more hopeful in the mercy of Allah, and so on and so forth. But rather, and he, what has been mentioned to us in the Kitab and the Sunnah Yakfina, that is enough for us. Just like the worship is enough for us. If a person was to say that they have a better way to get close to Allah with worship, then we say simply, have you done everything of worship that has been legislated already and made that your habit to the point that you need to find something else to do? Really? And so we say the same thing for people who are fuduliyun, people who are just extra. People who are just extra. We say to them, have you learned all that there is in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, in the tafsir of the salaf about the names and the attributes of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala to the point that you need to go beyond that. Are you bored with what you have found and you committed that to memory and you've internalized that and you've digested that and you made that a part of who you are and been affected by that in your worship and so on and so forth to the point that now you have to ask these theoretical, silly, pseudo-intellectual questions. Right? And so we say that it is simply like that. Another answer that was given by the Salaf that has a ma'akhad upon it, that the scholars took some issue with, not great issue with, but they disliked this answer from a wajh, from the wajh, from the aspect of what we just mentioned, that the best answer is the answer of Rabi'a al rai and his student Malik ibn Anas, when they were asked about the istiwa of Allah, and they gave the answer that we mentioned. The same applies to the nuzul of Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. However, the great Imam of Khurasan in the third generation of Islam, Ishaq ibn Rahawi, Rahimahullah ta'ala, he, when he was asked this question, he said, Awala yastati' rabbuna ayanzil min duna ayakhlu minhu al arsh? Doesn't Allah have the ability to descend without leaving his throne? Doesn't Allah have the ability to descend without leaving His throne? Meaning, does Allah descending mean that Allah leaves His throne? The issue that the scholars had with that is that, and it's better to just say what Imam Malik said, right? Without going into further explanation. However, that's a valid statement. That is a valid statement and it is mentioned in the writings of the scholars. And he is a, as an answer that Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala himself uh, mentioned from Ishaq. And he, it is likewise a statement uh, that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala and Ibn Qayyim and others have mentioned in their writings. And he, that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, and he has the ability to descend. And he, you don't know the mechanics and the dynamics of the universe of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and, he, and how things are. And he, that is something that is far from your mind, far from your intellect, so on and so forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he, from his sifa from his sifat in thatiyah, from his eternal attributes as al-ulu, is his highness above his creation. Tabarak wa ta'ala. His highness above his creation. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yastawi wa yanzil, kayfa sha'a mata sha'a. He ascends and descends as he wills, and when he wills. Tabarak wa ta'ala. The nuzul of Allah, Allah descending and coming near to his creation, is a sharaf for his creation, is an honor for the creation. And, he, and we know that Allah, as we mentioned, descends in the last sort of every night. Likewise, Allah descends on which day of the year? Which day of the year? Very special day. On Arafah. Wa yubahi bihimul malaika. And he sees the creation, ash'ath aghbar. And he disheveled with dust on their clothing, so on and so forth. And he boasts about them to his angels. And he says, Mada arada ha'ula? He said, look at them and what they want from me. Meaning they want my mercy and my forgiveness. And they have come from the ends of the earth to stand upon this mountain where they took this covenant with me. That they will worship me alone. Begging for my forgiveness. Allah wa ta'ala boasts about them to the malaika. Mada arada ha'ula? What do they want? He says, what do they want? Boasting about them to his malaika. Likewise, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala would descend and he, from his arsh to his kursiyas comes in some narrations, the faslil qadha, and he, for the beginning of the judgment, after the creation stare at the sky in terror for 40 years, the paradise, uzlifat al jannatu lil muttaqeen, the paradise is brought close and in view of the muttaqeen and the hellfire, 
is brought close in view of all of the creation. And the malaika descend from the heavens to the earth. Saffan saffa wa ji'a yawma idhim bi jahannam. And the creation they see, the sun brought close to the earth and they start to sweat. And they start to sink according to what they did of bad deeds into the earth and so on and so forth. And they will stare and tear at the sky for 40 years and go to the prophets individually one after another after another seeking the intercession. And the Prophet ﷺ, he will say, Ana laha, ana laha. I am the one that must do it. I am the one who will do it. And that is Maqamun Mahmud, the praiseworthy station of the Prophet ﷺ, where his intercession is uh, uh, followed by Allah wa ta'ala beginning the judgment of the creation. And ask Allah wa ta'ala for as salamu wa afiyah and for safety and well being on that day. Tayyib. And so Allah wa ta'ala, He ascends and He descends in a manner befitting His Majesty. A Shaykh, Shaykhuna Zayd ibn Muhammad al Madkhali, Rahimahullah ta'ala, the great scholar of as Samita, as Samta, in the south of Saudi Arabia, who passed away some years back, he said, Wa mima yadkhulu fi hadha al bab. باب الأسماء وصفات إثبات علوه تعالى على خلقه وأنواع العلو ثلاثة that included in this topic of the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is affirming the highness of Allah above his creation and the types of ulu the types of highness are three we know from the names and the attributes of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala from his attributes as we heard is the attribute of al-ulu of highness from the names of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala that is authentic as Al-Ali. Al-Ali. Alif Lam Ali. The one who has absolute highness. Al-Ala. The Most High. Al-Muta'al. Al-Muta'al. And the one who has the attribute of يعني, Ta'ali. يعني, of being lofty and exalted above his creation. All of these are close in meaning. Yani Al-A'la is stronger in meaning than Al-Ali and Al-Muta'al is stronger in meaning than Al-A'la. These are from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we mention one of these names in our salat, all throughout our salat. What do we say? Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. So now you have a way to remember something that you are, either you know or that you are about to learn. That you can act upon while you are in your salat because you are supposed to be thinking about the meanings of what you are saying. And so whenever you say, Ala'ala, this name of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, that the meaning of Ala'ala has three interconnected meanings. Has three interconnected meanings. Right? Three types of ulu. Three types of highness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are ulu wa that Allah's highness and essence. That Allah tabarak wa ta'ala ba'inun min khalqihi. That He is separate from His creation above everything in the universe. Everything in existence, Allah is above it. Tabarak wa ta'ala. In his essence. The second is Ulu al Qahri wa Sultan. Ulu al Qahr wa Sultan. The highness of Allah pertaining his Qahr, his omnipotence, his boundless power, and his Sultan, his authority. It's the second type. So from the meanings of the name of Allah, Al-Ali, Al-A'la, Al-Muta'al is Al-Qahar. Is Al-Qahar or Al-Qahir. As Allah says in the Quran, وَهُوَ الْقَاهِرُ فَوْقَ عِبَادِهِ And He is Al-Qahir فَوْقَ عِبَادِهِ He is Al-Qahir, the omnipotent, the one who has overwhelming power, 
above all of his creation. Meaning that the power of Allah supersedes and is above the power of everything. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِهِ And there is no might or no strength except through Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. There is not an atom that moves except by the will of Allah and the decree of Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. And so from the highness of Allah is, his, is the highness of His power and authority. عُلُو الْقَحْرِ وَسُلْطَانِ عُلُو الْقَحْرِ وَسُلْطَانِ the Highness of Allah and His Qahr and His Sultan and His power and His authority, Tabarak wa Ta'ala. And the third type of Highness for Allah, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is Ulu al-Qadri wa-Sifat. Ulu al-Qadri wa-Sifat. Or some of them say Ulu al-Sha'an. Ulu al-Sha'an. The Highness of Allah and His Sha'an, in His status. In His status. As the Prophet وسلم, he said, لا أحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك. I do not have the ability to praise you fully as you deserve to be praised, but rather you are as you have praised yourself. Meaning that whatever you can understand with your limited human mind about the perfection of Allah, pertaining all of His names and all of His attributes, then Allah is greater than that and he is and his perfection is higher than that his perfection is higher than that so is the highness of al-qadr or sifat the highness of allah pertaining his status and his attributes tabarak wa ta'ala that whatever you can understand of the attributes of allah we'll give an example the moral of the story of musa and khadr right what was the moral of the story? We read or should read on a weekly basis as we read that surah, that if you read it every Jum'ah, it will fill what is between Jum'atain, Inura, it will fill what is between the two Jum'ahs with light for you, with, meaning with, with guidance for you. Which is which surah? Surah Al-Kahf, right? And in Surah Al-Kahf we have the story of Musa and Khadr, right? That we should try to read every week and take lesson of. What is the moral of the story? Patience, patience. What did Musa do or not do that caused him to seek out Khadr? He was asked, who is the most knowledgeable person on the earth? And he said, without hesitation, with certitude, me. That's what he said, right? He said it was him. He was, he was uh, from Ulul Azmi Mina Rusul, right? But there was a servant who had knowledge that he didn't have. Right? Who had knowledge that he didn't have. Who was Khadr. Some of the prophets, or some of the scholars rather, they say he was a prophet. Some of the scholars, they say he was from the righteous servants of Allah. Really, there's not a whole lot of benefit in delving into that issue. Right? Whatever the case is, he had some knowledge that Musa didn't have. Right? And so he should have said, what? Allahu A'lam. Allah knows best, or another way you could say is Allah has more knowledge. Allah has most knowledge. Like you say, Akbar, the most great, Allah has the most knowledge, right? Allah has knowledge above the knowledge of everything else, higher than the knowledge of everything else. So instead of saying Allah knows best, Allah has more knowledge about that issue, He, without any hesitation, He said that it was Himself who had the most knowledge on that earth, right? And so, Musa and Khadr, we know the story, and the different situations in the story, when they were, there's an authentic hadith where Musa and Khadr were in the boat, right? We know the story, and he, where the boat was tipped in the Qur'an, so on and so forth. There's a hadith explaining the story in the Qur'an that gives us, and he, the moral of the story. It gives us the moral of the story where a uh, usfur, which is a small bird, probably smaller than a pigeon, perched on the side of the, uh, of the boat, right? And it dipped its beak into the water, it pecked the water with its beak, and it took out a drop of water, right? Took out a drop of water. Musa, he turned to Khadr, he said, مَا عِلْمِي وَعِلْمُكَ فِي عِلْمِ اللَّهِ 
what is my knowledge and your knowledge compared to the knowledge of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, except for what except for the likes of what this bird took out of the ocean. Right? Meaning Kalashe. There is no comparison. It's something unfathomable. Right? Whatever you could imagine about the knowledge of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attribute of knowledge for Allah ibn Qayyim he says is a'amu sifati ani bi It is the most general knowledge is the most general attribute of Allah pertaining what it is connected to. <coughs> pertaining what it is connected to. Right? And so Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, his attribute of knowledge is one of the most vast and important attributes to know about Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. We heard in our last setting, in our last uh, sitting, our last session, we heard uh, the statement of Allah, or Allah, the evidence that Allah created us to know Him, right? Which is the last verse of which surah? Surah Al-Talaq, right? Surah Al-Talaq. Right? As Allah who created the seven heavens and the likes of the other earth, He and His order descends between the heavens and the earth. He has done all of that, created everything, sent the revelation, put qadr into motion. Why? لِتَعْلَمُوا So that you can all know, we can all know, and Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, that Allah has power over all things, and that Allah encompasses all things in knowledge. These two attributes of Allah, His knowledge and His power, are the basis of knowing everything about Allah's names and attributes, some of the scholars say. Right? And so, it's from the reasons that Allah created us so that we can know about His knowledge and His power. When we know about Allah's knowledge and His power, then we choose what Allah has chosen for us. When you make your choice subservient to the choice of Allah, what is that called? When you make the choices in your life, and how you live your life, according to what Allah wants from you, what is that called? That's good. It's called Islam. It's called submitting. Submitting your will to the will of Allah, right? Because why? Because Allah knows better and Allah has the most power, right? And because of these two attributes of Allah, look at, we'll give you two examples, right? The first is dua al istikhara. The dua of istikhara. A person says, Oh Allah, I ask you, بِعِلْمِكْ إِنِّي أَسْتَخِرُكَ بِعِلْمِكَ وَأَسْتَقْدِرُكَ بِقُدْرَتِكَ وَأَسْأَلُكَ مِنْ فَضْلِكَ الْعَظِيمِ فَإِنَّكَ تَعْلَمْ وَلَا أَعْلَمْ وَتَقْدِرْ وَلَا أَقْدِرْ وَأَنْتَ عَلَّامٌ خُيُوبٌ أَلَوْهُمَّ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَدْرِي أَنَّ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ خَيْرٌ فِي دِينِي وَدُنْيَايَ وَعَاقِبَةِ أَمْرِي To the end of it, right? Oh Allah, I ask you to choose for me because of your knowledge of the unseen and your power over the creation. I leave the choice to you. I surrender the choice to you. I ask you for help in the choice. Right? Because you know and I don't know. And you have power and I don't have any power. And you are the knower of everything that is unseen. If you know that this affair is better for me, in my deen, my dunya, and the end result of my affair, then make it easy for me, decree it for me, and then bless me in it. To the end of the dua, right? Another example. The hadith of Ammar ibn Yasir, I believe, where Ammar ibn Yasir, he came, I believe he was in Kufa, and he led the people in the salat, or the people rather, they saw him praying in the nafila, and he made a lengthy sajda, and in the sajda he made a dua, and they could hear him making a dua. And he said that I, that there's a dua I learned from the Prophet wasallam that I make frequently. And it's a lengthy dua, but we'll just mention the beginning of it and how it opens, Right? That the Prophet Sallallahu used to say, Allahumma bi ilmi kal ghayba kudratika ala al khalq. Ahyini ma ta'alam an al hayat khayrani. Ahyini ma damat al hayat khayrani. O oh Allah, by your, because of your knowledge of the unseen and your power over the creation. Right? I ask you to allow me to live so long as life is better for me. You know as long as life is better for me. And to allow me to die when death is better for me. In the end of the, of the dua, O oh Allah, I ask you for a shawq ila liqa'ik, for an anxiousness and longing to meet you. Wa ladhata nadri ila wajhika al-kareem. And the pleasure of looking at your beautiful, noble face. Mi ghayri dharra'i mudhirratin wa la fitnatin mudhilla. Without in the interim period between now and then, going through any substantial great harm, 
or being set astray by fitna. Right? So a person doesn't know. Death might be better for them. There may be some fitna on the horizon that if Allah was to take you right now and spare you from fitna and allow you to meet him in this condition, it would be better for you than to be tried. Right? Allah give us long lives and righteous deeds. But the reality of the affair is like that. From the mercy of Allah is that Allah wa ta'ala takes his servant, so the servant you fall with amra. He surrenders the affair to Allah. Why? Because of your knowledge of the unseen and your power over the creation. Because of your knowledge of the unseen, your power of the creation, the person he submits his choice to Allah wa ta'ala. The more he knows that about Allah wa ta'ala, the more he will submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he knows that Allah's knowledge is above his knowledge and the knowledge of all of the creation. And Allah's power is above his power and the power of all of the creation. The same thing is said about all of Allah's names and attributes. That from the highness of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is ulu al qadri wa sifat. The highness of Allah and his status and attributes. In pertaining every single attribute and name of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His perfection is above and beyond what you can begin to imagine about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have three types of highness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hit me. Don't hit me. Metaphorically hit me. Right? I'm fragile these days. Huh? Uluwat. At that. The highness of Allah pertaining His? His being and His essence. The highness of Allah pertaining His? His power and His authority. And the highness of Allah pertaining His status and His and His attributes. Tabarak wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a person says, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. For this reason, al-A'la is from the greatest names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it is the name of Allah that includes the meaning of all of His names. It is the name of Allah that includes the meaning of all of His names. As regards which of Allah's names is He the Most High? in his status and in his attributes. Some of them or all of them? All of them. It's an attribute of Allah that applies to all of his names. For that reason, it is from the greatest names of Allah. And the greatest names of Allah are those names that when you call upon him, he answers. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you have something to use in your dua. Right? And so, the person, when he is in sajda, right? When he is in ruku', he says, Subhanahu Rabbi al Azim, Right? He assigns Adama to Allah. Al A'la, Al Ulu, and he, being the Most High, He reserves that for Sajda when He is closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is, it is greater than His Adama, right? It is greater than His Adama, right? His Ulu, the highness of Allah wa ta'ala is vaster in its meaning and applies to all the names, even though and he, all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is Azim pertaining all of his names. And he is the ulu of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And he is something that is broader even in meaning. He is even more broad than that in meaning. As Ibn Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that the asma of Allah in their meanings, they have tafawut. And he, as regards the, the strength of the meaning that they carry, and he, they, have, they are on different levels. Right? They are on different levels. The same thing with the attributes of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. Some of them have stronger meanings than others. The name of Allah that has the greatest meaning is Allah, right? And all the names of Allah go back to the, uh, the scholars. They say the name of Allah, Allah, Ar Rabb, and Ar Rahman. That the Quran and some of them they add Al Malik, right? Allah, Ar Rabb, and Ar Rahman. That the Quran begins with the Fatiha, right? That all the names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala go back to these, and these are from His greatest names, so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding his ulu, when a person says subhanahu wa rabbi ala, there's a lot to think about, right? A lot to stay in sajda for. The longer you stay in sajda, the better. Think about those meanings. That Allah above the entire universe, right, is most high. He hears me right now. His hearing is above the hearing of anything else, beyond what you can begin to imagine, right? His knowledge is above the knowledge of everything. Allah knew what I would say before I, before I even said it, Right? And he thinks about the highness of Allah pertaining his essence as being above everything and his attributes. He thinks about the attributes of Allah and his qahr and his sultan, his power and his authority. His power and his authority specifically from his attributes. Specifically from his attributes, his power and his authority. There is nothing in the universe that escapes the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
There is nothing in the universe that escapes the power of Allah wa ta'ala. Allah from above the universe manages the affairs and disposes of the affairs of all of his creation. This is from his names and his attributes and is from his rububiyya. It's from his lordship, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and his control of all affairs. The shaykh, he says, after mentioning these categories of ulu, of highness and loftiness for Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, he says, فَهِيَ ثَابِتَةُ لِلَّهِ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى عِنْدَ أَهْلِ السُنَةِ وَالْجَمَعَةِ These three categories are affirmed with Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Yani they are firmly established and verified with Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah according to what is found in the Book of Allah, in the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَقَدْ أَنْكَرَتْ فِرَقُ الضَّلَالِ عُلُوَ الذات وَنَازَعُ فِي ذَلِكَ فَقَالُوا there are a number of deviant sects that reject the highness of Allah in His essence. Tabarak wa ta'ala. That Allah in His being and essence is above the creation. And they disputed in this regard. Tore away, naza'u, tore away in dispute from Ahlul Sunnah in this regard. And they said, Inna Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. لَيْسَ مُسْتَوِيًا عَلَىٰ عَرْشِهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not actually ascended above His throne. لِأَنَّهُ يَلْزَمُ مِنَ الْإِسْتِوَىٰ عَلَىٰ الْعَرْشِ مُشَابَحَةَ الْمَخْلُوقَاتِ Because if we were to say that Allah is ascended above His throne, that this will be likening Allah to His creation. So we mentioned that every mu'attil is what? A mushabbih. Last week, right? For every person who rejects an attribute of Allah, the process that they, went to, that they went through to do that was to first compare Allah to His creation. So what they were running from, they fell on their silly faces, right? Right into it, right? They fell on their faces right into what they were running from. Smack dab in the middle of any, what they were trying to run from. They said that we don't want to compare Allah to His creation, so we can't affirm this for Allah. So you rejected this from Allah because you first compared Allah to His creation. We say, quite simply, that what we just mentioned in this dars, about the arsh and the kursi, what is found in the kitab and the sunnah and so on and so forth, does that sound like we believe about Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, like Allah is like a man sitting in a chair? Is that what you get from that? Abadan. How could a person ever take from what we just heard anything of the sort? That what we just heard is something beyond what can be imagined, beyond what is fathomable. It's something that fills the heart of the creation with an awareness of the greatness and the loftiness of Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala that Allah is separate and apart from His creation, above it all, in control of it all, and lofty in every way, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the belief of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah ala marr zaman throughout the ages, throughout the epochs of time. This is what they agree upon, what they are unanimous upon. He says, وَلِذَا مِنْهُ مَنْ قَالَ إِنَّهُ مُتَّحِدٌ بِجَمِيعِ مَخْلُقَاتِهِ He says, and for this reason, some of them, they went so far as to say that Allah is united in His essence with all of the creation. That Allah shares in His essence with all of the creation. And this is what is called Wahdatul Wujud, the belief in the oneness of existence. It is a belief of the Greek philosophers. It is a belief of Pythagoras, who had a cult of people that worshipped him as a deity. It is a belief from Pythagoras to Plato, of the majority of the Greek philosophers, who had cults who worshipped them as deities besides Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala who rejected, who said that the creator or the maker of the, the initiator, they said, of the universe is, in, is ineffable. There is no way to describe him, to assign any words to describe him. And this eventuated, it led them into pure mysticism, where they believe that a person can go through certain rituals, mystic rituals, to become one with the divine, to become one with the divine. So those people who call that, at the end of the day, they are trying their best to become deities. That is their belief. No matter how far they run from it, this is what is found, tasrihan, explicitly in their statements. 
explicitly in their statements that a person can go through certain rituals to prove his love. We know that if a person truly loves Allah, then what? Allah. He follows the Prophet wasallam so that Allah will love him. Right? But they, in proving their love of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, going past the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, depriving themselves of food, drink, meat, socializing, sexual intercourse, so on and so forth, introducing monasticism into Islam. The practice of the Christian monks who took it from the Greek philosophers, right? Going off, chanting in a cave somewhere until you start to hallucinate and see visions. And you see beings of light start to talk to you and so on and so forth. And these sorts of things. And the shaitan has taken them by the reins and led them to their destruction and made them dhalun mudilun. People who are astray, leading other people into misguidance that is worse than the misguidance of the Nasara. Because the Nasara, they took the same logic from the Greek philosophers and applied it to Isa ibn Umariyam. And they assigned these attributes to Isa ibn Umariyam. And then by extension, they have was, by extension they have what's called the communion of the saints. The communion of the saints. And they have, sanc- they have, they have, uh, they have uh, uh, sacraments where a person goes through certain things like the Lord's Supper and so on and so forth, where they believe that the flesh and the blood of Christ becomes one with the human body and so on and so forth. And through this ritual, a person, he becomes one with the Godhead, just like the pagan mystery religions of Egypt and uh, Asia and so on and so forth. And so in reality, I mean, they took a page right from the Christians, but they even went further. The Sufis went even further with it. And they said that all of the creation is Allah, and Allah is all of the creation. If you want to know about the greatness of Allah, look at the universe around you. They don't say this is the sign of Allah's greatness, or the reminder of Allah's greatness, or the proof of Allah's greatness. They say the universe itself is Allah's greatness. That you are surrounded by the actual attributes of Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. And that Allah and the creation are one and the same. And this is a statement of the Mutasawifa, of the mystics from the Sufis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's refuge is sought. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, there's no doubt that people who are like this, or rather Ibn Taymiyyah said in his book, at tisrini his refutation of Ibn Tis'een, and likewise in his refutation of Ibn Farid, who were two imams of the Sufis who taught these types of uh, disbelieving creeds and dogmas. In his refutation, he said that those people who follow behind, behind these types of charlatans, who, after reaching these mystic states, states, they start to perform supernatural feats with the help of the shayateen, right? And so they start to fly in the air and walk on water and so on and so forth, right? He said that the likes of these people, if the Dajjal was to emerge, there is no doubt that they would be his followers. If the Dajjal was to emerge, that the majority of them will be from the followers of the Messiah Dajjal. What would stop you? If you had that sort of belief system, what would stop you? What would stop a person from following the Dajjal when he emerges? And he makes the claims that he makes. Right? And so it is very important for a person to understand this creed and how people deviated from this creed across the ages. He says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and so some of them they say this statement, and some of them they say that innahu halin fi makhruqatihi that Allah becomes incarnate within the creation, within some of the creation. So some of them they go to the extreme of saying that Allah and the creation is one and the same, that Allah and the creation is one and the same, right? And some of them they say that Allah becomes a part of some of His creation. Allah becomes a part of some of His creation, not all of His creation. The first group they are called al itihadiya al itihadiya those who teach wahdatul wujud, the oneness of existence. And the others they are called, the second group who, yani, who say that Allah becomes incarnate in some of His creation, they are called al hululiya al hululiya So the first group of these deviants they are called al itihadiya 
The second groups of these deviants, they are called al hululiya both of them are kuffar. Both of them are kuffar. And this is the ruling upon them, bil ijmal. And a general ruling. As regards the ta'yeen, and if a person was to say a statement like Allah is everywhere, something of the sort, then this requires iqamatul hujjah. It requires to establish the hujjah upon the individual person, for that person to be explained to him the proofs and the evidence from the kitab and the sunnah. When asarra ala dalanihi, if he persists upon his misguidance, then and he, that person falls into disbelief. And he, but as our scholars have said, it is not our job as scholars of the truth, as any people who are merciful towards the creation to try to expel people from Islam. We are trying to include people in the fold of Islam. We're trying to bring people into the fold of Islam, right? So it's not our preoccupation. It's enough for us to say that in general, those who make that sort of statement are kufar. And he be ayanihim, however, individually on a case-by-case basis, for those people who, in general, they are actually Muslims, and he, in general, they are Muslims, right? Then we say on a case-to-case basis, it requires the establishment of the proof against that person before he can be assigned disbelief and recognized to have left the fold of Islam. And that is something for the people of knowledge, for the scholars. Big issues are for big scholars, right? And so, I mean, these sorts of issues have become widespread in the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah wa ta'ala return this Ummah back to its glory and back to its correct understanding. So the Shaykh, he says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَالَ إِنَّهُ فِي كُلِّ مَكَانٍ So some of them they say that Allah wa ta'ala is in all places. Some of them they say that He is one and the same with His creation. Some of them they say that He becomes incarnate in some of the creation. وَهَذِهِ مَذَاهِبْ وَنِحَلٌ بَاطِلًا all of these are false doctrines and false dogmas. إِذَا أُطْلِقَ عَلَى الْفِرَقِ الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ هَذِهِ الْمَقَالَاتِ الْإِتِحَادِيَّةِ وَالْحُلُولِيَّةِ And as we just heard, any, the labels of الْإِتِحَادِيَّةِ and حُلُولِيَّةِ are applied to the groups who have these false beliefs. الْإِتِحَادِيَّةِ are those who say, that the Creator and the creation are the same being and the same essence, the same thing. مَفَرَّقُوا بَيْنَ الْخَالِقِ الْعَظِيمِ وَالْمَخْلُوقِ الْحَقِيرِ بَلْ سَوَّوا بَيْنَهُمْ They don't make any distinction between the great, tremendous Creator and the pitiful, weak creation, but rather they make them one and the same. وَالْحُلُولِيَّ قَالُوا And the second group, the Hululiya. They are those who say, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَالٌ فِي كُلِّ مَكَانٍ وَفِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ That Allah becomes, that Allah can become incarnate in any place or anything. كَبُرَتْ كَلِمَةً تَخْرُجُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ إِنْ يَقُولُونَ إِلَّا كَذِبًا How terrible is the statement that comes from their mouths? They say nothing but lies. وَالْجَمْعَ بَيْنَ النُّصُوصَ الَّتِي جَاءَ فِيهَا ذِكْرُ عُلُوِ اللَّهِ عَلَى خَلْقِهِ بِذَاتِهِ وَبَيْنَ النُّصُوصَ الَّتِي دَلَّتْ عَلَى قُرْبِ اللَّهِ مِنْ خَلْقِهِ هُوَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَرِيبٌ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ فِي عُلُوِهِ قَرِيبٌ بِعِلْمِهِ بِعِحَاطَتِهِ بِهِمْ وَهُوَ عَلِيٌّ عَلَى عَرْشِهِ بِذَاتِهِ فَلَا تَضَادَّ وَلَا تَعَارُذَ بَيْنَ النُّصُوصِ الْقُرْبِ وَالْمَعِيَّةِ وَبَيْنَ النُّصُوصِ الْعُلُوِ وَالْفَوْقِيَّةِ He said, and together, to go back to the beginning of our discussion between the highness of Allah and His being separate from His creation and the closeness of Allah to His creation. And Allah being His ma'iyah, His being with His creation. Tabarak wa ta'ala, how we bring these two things together is as follows, that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, that He is near the creation in His highness. That Allah in His highness is near His creation. That Allah in His highness is near His creation. So Allah wa ta'ala is Aliyun Azim. He is the most high and the most magnificent wa ta'ala. The entire universe in the in the Kaf al Rahman, in the palm of Al Rahman, as Ibn Abbas said authentically, is like a khardal bi kafi ahadikum or fi kafi ahadikum. It is like less than a mustard seed in your hand. The entire universe in the palm of Allah wa ta'ala is like less than a mustard seed in your hand. Yani Allah wa ta'ala is nearer to His creation than anything else. Right? 
although he is a sep separate and above and beyond his creation. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala in his knowledge and in his power and his authority. And he, there is nothing that can supersede his knowledge and his authority. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? For this reason, the believer is courageous. Prophet Sallallahu we know the narration from the seerah that's authentic. Or a Bedouin, he found the Prophet Sallallahu making uh, taking Qaylula, taking the afternoon siesta, the afternoon nap under the shade of a tree. And the, he had uh, hung his, the sheath of his sword with his sword in it upon the branch of the tree. And the Bedouin, he took out the sword of the Prophet Sallallahu right? And he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, who will protect you from me, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled and he said, Allah, Allah, right? Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala is between me and you, right? Meaning that the power of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the protection of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has guaranteed. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said in the Quran, Wallahu ya'asimuka min nas He said to his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, survived a number of assassination attempts, any bounties that were placed for exorbitant amounts of money upon the head of the Prophet ﷺ by the Sanadid of Quraysh, by the wealthy chieftains of the Quraysh. And Prophet ﷺ, after a number of uh, attempts of assassination against his life when he was fleeing from Mecca and thereafter, the Prophet ﷺ had uh, guards at his door when he slept at night. ﷺ. And Allah wa Ta'ala revealed these verses. Revealed the verse, Wallahu ya'asimu kamin al nas, that Allah will protect you from the people. And he dismissed his bodyguards. So when this man pulled and he, the sword of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi from his sheath and he said, Who will protect you from me? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allah. Right? Allah tabarak wa ta'ala ma'aladina taqwa wa ladina hum muhsinun. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is with the believers and his knowledge and his power and his authority and his help and his support and so on and so forth. <laughs> And so the person he knows is about Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala. That Allah's knowledge and Allah's mercy and Allah's power and so on and so forth, that it encompasses all things and it reaches all things. And there is nothing any, that can happen to a person except by the leave of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, the will of Allah, the, the preordainment of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when a person has this type of understanding, and then he can understand how Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, while being above everything, is near all things, and his knowledge and how his knowledge encompasses all things, and his power encompasses all things, and so on and so forth. And he is above his throne in his essence, and there is no contradiction between this and that, and there is no ta'aruth, there is no conflict between the texts that mention the qurb of Allah and his ma'iyah, the nearness of Allah, and his being with the creation, وَبَيْنَ النُّصُوصَ الْعُلُوِّ وَالْفَوْقِيَّةِ And the text pertaining Allah's ulu and his fawqiyah, Allah's highness and his, above, and his being above all things. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which texts are more? The texts that mention Allah being near his creation? Or the texts that mention Allah wa ta'ala being above his creation? Which are more in number in the Quran and Sunnah? The texts that mention Allah being above the creation. So if anything... And these are the core texts. And the texts that are less in number than them, by far, that mention Allah being with the believers, so on and so forth, and they are understood in light of that which is more firmly uh, explained and elaborated upon by Allah wa Taala all throughout the Qur'an. As we mentioned, some scholars wrote entire books just about this issue from them. Imam al-Dhahabi rahimullah ta'ala has an entire book, around 300 pages on the topic. Ibn Abi Shayba rahimullah ta'ala has a book called the Book of Al-Arsh, the Book of the Throne of Allah, Tabarak wa ta'ala mentioning these texts. Ibn Qayyim's book, Ijtima' al-Juyush al Islamiyah, almost the entire book is about this issue of the highness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above his throne. Because once this attribute is passed over by the people of innovation, then every other attribute is denied. Every other attribute is up for questioning and so on and so forth. This attribute is mentioned all throughout the Qur'an and the Sunnah in so many ways that it is unquestionable exactly what it means. Exactly what it means. Allah wa Ta'ala has explained all things in great detail. And if it meant something other than what it says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have explained it and the Prophet wasallam would have explained it. Technically, technically, here he mentions Al-Qurb, Wal-Ma'iyah. 
Al-Qurb wal Ma'iya. Likewise, the Shaykh Sa'ari rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions it again uh, on page 15. On page 15, he reiterates this point. The Qurb of Allah, along with his being, Ali wa Na'ala Muta'ala, right? And there is no difference between the nearness of Allah and the highness of Allah and his being separate from his creation. One thing that also helps us with this issue is that technically the qurb of Allah, the nearness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only one type. Ibn Qayyim mentions in Bada'i al-Fawaid and elsewhere that what is found in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the qurb of Allah has a specific meaning, not a general meaning. It has a specific meaning. There are other attributes of Allah like His ma'iyah, His being with the believers, right? Being with the believers, and he pertaining his uh, help and his assistance and so on and so forth. But that also has a specific meaning. And the attribute of al-ihata, Allah is al-muhit and his knowledge encompasses all things, surrounds all things, so on and so forth, is what is actually intended here. The qurb of Allah wa ta'ala, has a specific meaning. It doesn't have a general meaning. Technically, it doesn't have a general meaning. Meaning, it, does, it isn't applied generally to say that Allah is near all of the creation. But rather, what Allah mentions in the Qur'an is a specific, special nearness. Allah wa ta'ala, he said, in the verses about fasting, in Surah Al-Baqarah, He said, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٍ That when my servants ask you about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٍ That indeed I am close. The scholars, they say, some of them have pointed out that he didn't say, say to them, O Muhammad Sallallahu that I am close. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, that his answer, his response is close. Is what is meant, as we'll come to see. And so Allah, his response was closer than even saying to the Prophet, then say to them that I am close. That inni qareeb, they ask you, so I am close. Right? His response was even closer than asking the Prophet, or saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi then say to them that I am close. What does that mean? That I am close. Is that the end of the verse? Ujibu da'wat al-da'i idha da'ani fal yastajibu li wal yu'minu bi la'allahum yarshudun. He said, Tabarak wa ta'ala, explaining what is meant by his qurb. Ujibu da'wat al-da'i idha da'ani. I respond to the summoning of the one who calls upon me when he calls upon me. So as a specific meaning, a special meaning, right? And so we don't say because there is not evidence for it that the closeness of Allah is something that is general to all of the creation. We would rather we say the ihata of Allah and His attributes and His knowledge and His power and His authority. And he, Allah encompasses all things in knowledge and power and wisdom and authority and mercy and so on and so forth. And he, there are about nine things that I mentioned by Sa'adi in one of his writings about the ihata of Allah, the different attributes of Allah that Allah surrounds all things and his knowledge, and his power, and his authority, and his mercy, and his justice, and so on and so forth, right? And he, but when we say the qurb, or we say the ma'iyah, it has a specific, special meaning. Allah is with the believers. Alladheena taqaw, those who have taqwa, waladheena hum muhsinoon. In Allah ma'al ma'al sabirin. Indeed, Allah is with the sabirin. He is with them, helping them, and guiding them, and sustaining them, and protecting them, and so on and so forth, right? And so... Actually, what is mentioned and he, in the text about this issue, about this issue, Allah wa ta'ala, and he, what is mentioned here in the speech of this great scholar, and he being near his creation, while being above his creation, and he, it is actually even more limited than that. It is even more limited than that. The, the, to be uh, just very, very detailed about the issue. Otherwise, and he, we know what is meant by the scholars, we're not objecting to what the scholars say, and this is something that you find in the language of the scholars, but to be very, very technical, when you look in the more detailed books of Aqidah, this is what is mentioned. So even when we mention Allah's qurb, or His ma'iyah, Allah being with the creation, or Allah's nearness to the creation, technically, the meaning is a special meaning, especially for the believers, and in connection to something that they have done, of coming close to Allah, and having traits and qualities that are love to Allah, Tabarak wa ta'ana. Therefore, what is left is ihata for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah being al-muhit, wasi'a. Yani kulla shayin rahmatan wa ilma. 
the sa'ah of Allah, the vastness of the meanings of the attributes of Allah and encompassing all things and so on and so forth. As we mentioned from the statement of the angels that carry the throne of Ar-Rahman, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, O Allah, you have, you have surrounded all things in knowledge and in mercy. And he, the ihata of Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, and he, that Allah encompasses all things in knowledge and power and so on and so forth. And he, besides that, I mean, what is mentioned is almost beyond what you can count of Allah being high above the creation and lofty above the creation, so on and so forth. I hope I did not belabor the point. However, it is something, as we have said, that is very, very, very important because there are multitudes of Muslims who probably number I mean, hundreds of millions, perhaps, who have these sorts of misunderstandings about these sorts of issues. And if we don't know about these issues... And if we're not the flag bearers of this aqidah, then who is going to do it? The answer is quite simple. And if we are disinterested, Allah may do away with us and bring about another people. Right? So this religion will be safeguarded. It has its ta'ifa mansura, it has, it has its rijal, it has its men, it has any of those who hold the banner of the sunnah and so on and so forth. It is very important for us to understand. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for thabat. في هذه الحياة وبعد الممات and for firmness and resolve in this life and after death هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم